Welcome to the State of Developer Education, a podcast by Major League Hacking. We explore how technical leaders are creatively tackling the developer education gap to help prepare the next generation of technologists for the real world and build businesses that can adapt to any changes in the technology ecosystem. I'm your host, John Gottfried. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the State of Developer Education. Uh, I'm here this week with Lorna Mitchell, who works in developer relations at Ivan. How are you doing, Lorna? Hi, I'm doing really well, thank you. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's great to have you. I'm really excited to learn more about what you've been doing. Um, So I always like to start with all of my guests going all the way back to the beginning. I find uh, where people started to be a really informative way to understand how they think about the world. so could you start off and tell us how you first learned to code? What, what was that experience like? I think there's a risk that I might date myself a little bit <laughs> doing this, um, which is, you know, I'm of a generation where we didn't learn to code in school because that wasn't really a thing. We had computers by the time I was going to university, um, but I was programming anything that moved. So my father's an engineer. We had a computer at home and we, we, you know, you had to type in the basic out of the books when I was little. Um, I had a graphical what, what, calculator. What size floppies are we talking here? I remember them both. I'm not sure if I really used them both, but I remember them both. Yeah. Um, and I had a graphical calculator that I could program, um, but I, technology wasn't available to study at school. Um, and also didn't go to the most forward thinking school. But anyway, so I went to university to study electronic engineering because I have A-levels in maths and physics. So that seemed cool. And one of the things I did during my degree was a little bit of software. And so since I graduated, well qualified to do electronics, I have a master's in engineering. Um, I've done software ever since. (laughs) Um, And that's kind of, I sort of taught myself and built the websites for the student societies when I was at university. And Honestly, my whole career has followed that model of being interested in a thing and then maybe getting to paid to do it, hopefully somewhere along the way. Um, I did a few years in different sort of software development roles. I made mm-hmm. games, I made payroll systems, but I crucially, well, we weren't very internet connected. Like I didn't mm-hmm. have, st- every time I moved jobs, the computer that was at work lost all my scripts because I had to leave them behind. Um, This is really telling a story about the dates, right? Um, So I started a blog where I could write down what I'd learned and refer back to it, not just in a hacky directory somewhere on the computer at work, but something that I could look back on. And it was always public. I'm not sure I ever believed anyone would read it. Quite a lot of people have at this point. but the blog helped me realize how much writing it down was helping me to get my thoughts in order. Um, and it, that's helps me to think about the topic and to understand things. I, I've heard that from other people too, that teaching a topic is the way to make the concept stick for themselves. Um, why, why do you think that is? Like, obviously you've, you've created a lot of technical content. Like, why is it such a powerful learning tool for the writer? I have created a lot of technical content. Just on my personal blog, I have more than a thousand posts. It's mm-hmm. a lot. Um, there's something there about you understand a thing well enough to do it, but to understand it well enough that you can give it to someone else needs an extra level and often makes you you know what to type, but do you know why? It makes you realize when you have and haven't internalized the things that you know. You need to put this file in this directory. It's great if you can explain why. And I think when you write, it makes you think, oh, there's a gap there. Yeah, I, I always remember, um, and it's been quite a while since I wrote uh, a tutorial, but I remember a lot of the time I would be researching like how the arguments for a particular command are structured and in doing so I often found like all of these alternative ways of doing it and so now I had to justify why I did it my way and like that process of like oh like I just did this by default because that was how I was taught but like here's all these other people's perspectives 
now I have to kind of like explain it. It was, it was, it was always a little bit challenging, but kind of like interesting as well. Like I, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like it gave you, gave me at least a much broader picture of different technology approaches. Yes. And I think whether you are, you know, really creating that written content or uh, engaging a lot in discussion with others in a different way, whether it's a user group or a discussion forum or something like that, you're putting an idea down and getting something back. And it really makes you think. And sometimes the audience doesn't need to be there for you to do that thinking, but it really, you have to form your thoughts and um, decide what should and should not be included in this. Like, because you could tell this whole story about all the alternative ways to do a thing. Um, I once worked with a really good editor who called this the garden path pattern. Well, you could do it this way and you could do it this way and you could do it this way, but they're all rubbish. So do it that way. And no, come on. Developers are skip readers. They're going to get lost down one of your paths. Just show the way and say why. Yeah, I think that's very wise. I noticed that a lot of the content you've created has been around the PHP ecosystem. Um, I got my start with PHP and web development as well. I feel like it's maybe not the thing a lot of new developers are learning first anymore. Um, why are you still excited about PHP? Like I, I, it feels like such an ingrained technology, but like what still gets you excited about it? This is a really great question. And there's a few different things going on there. I, I think you're right. And we do see fewer new developers learning it. In a way, that's a feature of how much the language has changed. At one time, it was a beginner's language. You could pick it up in a weekend and make something from it. It is not that now. Um, and so it serves a different audience. Yes, some of us are the same people because we grew up our programming skills as the language grew up. But I think that's one explanation why people tend to transfer in later. Um, it's also not particularly cool language. Like it's not, people are not really excited. It's not on the Stack Overflow most wanted list. Um, I find that super interesting because the people who complain about PHP haven't used it in the last 10 years. It is, if you've used PHP in the past, genuinely go have another look because it grew, it's all grown up now while you were not looking. I said to somebody recently, like, I could walk past PHP in the street and not recognize it. It's one of the things that I think is really important. And one of the things that I think really speaks volumes about this community that it's still growing, it's still evolving, it's still adapting to the needs of the people that use it. But yeah, runs some enormous percentage of the web still and is present in basically every enterprise on the planet somewhere when you're thinking about it from from the context of like education right um are there concepts that you think are unique to php or or missing from php that like uh you've sort of like struggled with over the years because i know that like okay like most students we work with are learning javascript you know javascript is far more asynchronous than I remember PHP being, right? So are there things like that where it's maybe falling behind or ahead of the curve that you, you still see? So I'm not so active in the PHP space now, and that's been one of the big big gifts to me of coming into developer advocacy is that it's given me, given me the ability to use many different tech stacks in my day-to-day -day working life, which perhaps as an engineer, I wouldn't have got hired to do this, but I love it. Um, but I think specifically with PHP, it's a very good grounding and gives you some really nice exposure to the concepts that are on the web. The majority of PHP developers do write some JavaScript anyway, because it's all on the client side. So hardly any PHP developer has never written any node. You know, the jump to Python is not that far. I'm seeing a lot of people reinventing themselves as Go programmers. Uh, you know, a long time ago, you can probably find video of me saying I would rather teach PHP to a computer scientist than computer science to a PHP developer. I'm not sure that's still true because we do have a complete object model. We are really big on software architecture. The language now is well designed and very performant and the frameworks also follow some really good practices that allow people to just keep on shipping 
um, and building what I call the interesting stuff because the repeat things are solved. Um, but I think when you've built some complex PHP applications, you have a pretty decent understanding of how the whole web stack works. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, so you mentioned uh, teaching computer science to a PHP programmer, and I'll generalize that. Like teaching computer science to someone who knows how to code but doesn't understand computer science. Um, I'm curious like how how you learn those concepts, right? Because you had kind of a non-traditional CS path. You know, you took more of the electrical engineering, self-taught programmer. Like when did computer science fundamentals come into play there? Do I know any computer science fundamentals? How do we know? I'm, my degree is in engineering and engineering is all about problem solving. So you need to understand your problem. You need to evaluate the solutions and you need to implement something. Know why you've chosen it and build in the best way that you can for now and for the future. And I think that attitude has helped me with everything. You know, yeah, sometimes I do need to know a little bit about an algorithm. I'm looking at performance. I can just pick that up, the thing that I need, as long as I understand my problem enough to go learn the thing that's going to solve it. Um, and so I and I've mostly worked in open source, server side, scripting languages, it is a very diverse group. We do have obviously a good percentage of computer science people around. So in terms of sort of herd knowledge, feel well supported in the community. And sometimes we follow best practices without knowing why, you know, you don't need to be able to build the compiler to be really effective with the tool or to teach someone else to build something amazing. Yeah, I completely agree. I, um, I got a history degree and also, you know, kind of, self-taught to code, had a lot of mentors, opportunities. Um, and it's rare that I've ever had to write, you know, a bubble sort from scratch. But uh, certainly when those concepts do come into play, it's like this whole different area to learn about. And it's kind of fun. It's kind of interesting. Um, I see a lot of the opposite, though, where like students coming out of school might understand the fundamentals and not know a lot of the coding. Um, what, what have you seen when, you, when you're working with people who are sort of entering into the industry and, and learning tech for the first time? First of all, I think it's much harder now than it was when I began. You know, you could be a webmaster in two weeks with a book from the library, and that is th so not true now. And I think also we have this idea that if the information's on the internet, we should know it. Like, oh, there's a new framework and I haven't learned it yet. People underestimate how much transferable knowledge they're gaining with each thing that they build. Everybody's different, but I think people really need the hands on. Think of a thing you'd like to build, not just your school assignment. You need to get your hands on things. You need to build things. One thing that I don't think I had really early in my career, but um, when I was doing a lot more Twitch streaming a couple of years ago, you know, we were all trapped in the house. I was streaming on Twitch. I never turn off my screen share when I've broken something because actually what you learn from someone debugging the way that I think about that, I mean, learning to talk and debug at the same time is like a whole new skill. Um, but seeing how someone thinks about that problem, this is the hardest thing to teach and the hardest thing to learn. When you see an error message, is, it, is that coming from your front end code? Is it from the server side? Did something go wrong in the database query? Has a cache failed somewhere? And I probably know, but how do I know? And how do I teach that? That stuff is hard. And the more things you build and the more things you break, um, the more skills you gain. So it is about looking to build different things and really reflect on what did I learn? Yeah, debugging is definitely a standalone skill and it's not, uh... I don't think it's frequently taught, but I do think it's it's sort of a forced learning that most people have at some point. Um, so so with Twitch streaming, uh, I've watched a lot of people stream coding, and it has this like weird appeal to it. You know, like there's something really um, interesting about watching the process of someone building software. Um, I know that you think a lot about the structure of what you are doing and sort of the narrative of teaching someone a concept. 
how do you incorporate that into to like live coding, for example, where so much can go wrong unexpectedly? Um, so I've done two different types of streams and one type is a little bit more prepared. You know, it's not conference demo standard, but I know what I'm going to build. I've built it at least once before. Maybe I even have a here's one I made earlier especially if I'm using a tech stack that I'm not super familiar with, having like a reference implementation to look at is useful. And honestly, even a stream walking through an existing tutorial with explanation can really unlock things for people in a way that I never thought I'd say that, in a way that's better than the written word. I am a person who learns best from words and I am a great believer in written content. Written content scales in a way that I can't express. You can access it in two years time when I've moved on and you've just started to learn this concept that I don't think is cool anymore. Um, you can translate it or have it spoken aloud or make the font size bigger, right? You can access and you can search it and find in page. It's very, very accessible. And often our study skills are really well developed for written content as well. But watching someone go through those pieces uh, can be really valuable. And I'll tell you where I learned this. So I never used to be a consumer of video at all. The only exception is that when I'm sewing, you can't see, but the sewing machine's on the other end of the desk from the laptop. <laughs> when I'm sewing, actually, it is really helpful to see like, oh, then you turn it around like this. And I, until you see that magical, how do you get from this thing? And then you turn it this way, you, you turn it which way? It's a little bit of that as well. And also when you're live with the live audience and they can say, wait, do that again. What just happened here? How did you know that thing should be set to false, right? And so if you're not articulating something that you think is obvious, I have forgotten learning many things, right? Because I've been doing this a long time, but I can wind it back and walk it forward again for somebody. Um, it's a bit like letting people look over my shoulder, but like I'm live on Twitch and there's, yeah. yeah, but I'm live on Twitch and there's hundreds of you. It's cool. Yeah. I, I feel like that's really unique. I, I mean, it's kind of funny because it, it is a phenomenon that's grown a lot in popularity, but I, I don't know if I've ever seen uh, like, I don't know, like an academic computer science classroom doing that, right? Like it's it's this bleeding edge technical education in some ways. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so you, you've you been doing this Twitch streaming for a while, certainly big big trend during the pandemic. Um, I know though that a lot of your recent work has been more in written format, right? And uh, you know has resulted in um, award-winning documentation in technical education, right? Like this is really kind of the the best of the best industry, you know, standard. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Like, could you you know describe for everyone what you created, and then we can dig in a little bit to like the the process and philosophy behind it. Yeah, sure. So the award-winning documentation uh, project that I'm currently working on, and I have worked on more than one, um, is the Ivan uh, developer documentation. So we're a cloud database company. Um, we do cool things for your data in the cloud, but it's non-trivial, right? This is pretty advanced and our audience is pretty advanced. We know that to create a really good developer experience, we need to have the documentation in place so that you can find your way either to learn about something or uh, to perform a particular task, especially where the Ivan version differs from the hosted, uh, like the standard open source versions, because we have like a nice web interface. So just showing you where things are um, is a big part of it. Um, I got into this, I think, because I, I missed my calling as a teacher, maybe. Um, we talked already about the blog. I can, I used to be on the support rotor, so like I can help you with a support thing, but if I wrote it down, hundreds of people could help themselves and immediately it would be there ready for you. I always think about the self-service developer resources as being like laying out the table for a party and everyone can just come and help themselves to whatever looks good to them. Um, 
And that's really how I think about documentation. Everyone's going to build a different plate, but we need to make sure that we've got something that is going to work for all the different all the different requirements. I love working with the written word, and I said a bit already about how scalable it is, how reusable it is. It's also really low friction to change things. So if we change the best way to do something or add an extra step in a process, we can edit the words. It's pretty low friction. If it's video or a lot of screenshots, it's more expensive to change things and more likely to get out of date. So um, I think it's there. We can read it. The machines can read it. It's findable. It's searchable. We have an open search on the back end uh, to make everything just really discoverable. And I think that well-structured information architecture and well-structured individual pieces really put the power tools in the hands of the developers and they're going to build things I could never imagine. All I got to do is give them the tools. Hmm. You mentioned that it's easy to update. I, I think that in itself might be uh, an indicator of where you are at in that process, right? And why this is best in class. Because I've seen a lot of organizations and worked at organizations where it is not easy to update those docs. Like it is a static HTML page on some weird Jekyll server somewhere that has nothing to do with the actual code libraries. And like, it's this whole disconnected, discombobulated mess, right? Like, like how did you actually get to a point where it is easy to update? I think we made some very clear choices about the tooling that we used, right? So um, Ivan's documentation site is Docs's code. So it's in a GitHub repository. It's actually a public project. So although most of the contributors work at Ivan, not all of them do. If you spot a problem with the docs, please just open a pull request, go for it. Uh, one of us will review. Um, and so having that familiar workflow best collaboration tools all of us have worked on content which had some sort of track changes or google doc comments or something else it is not a way to get work done or know who's changed what or compare two documents right we've solved that problem and it's in the tools that we use for our code so the docs as code set up exactly uses that um, our docs are actually restructured text rather than markdown because ivan's a python shop so more engineers new restructured text i love them equally that's not true i really love restructured text um i mean ascii doc is the clear winner but it's not really for normals um so having that kind of smooth workflow just i mean you can open the file in the github web interface and change the words that are now wrong and press the button and open a pull request like it's that sort of easy and it's a static site generator. So we, we review and merge. Whoever approves merges, it goes to main, deploys straight out to Cloudflare. Done. So obviously, the team that has built this are experienced technical you know, content creators, educators, whatever we want to call them. A lot of companies, engineers are responsible for the docs, right? Like, why is the direction that, that you know, you've know you gone in so successful for you? And I'm not gonna necessarily say that engineers writing docs is inherently bad, but like, why has this approach worked so well? So actually Ivan doesn't have documentation specialists. Um, we have some tech writers now, but the project was already in place. They're doing a wonderful job, but we didn't have them at the beginning. If we have documentation experts, you're looking at her. Um, well, that's what I meant, yeah, yeah. Like you're the documentation yeah. expert. But a lot of the contributors, not so much. And we have people contributing from right across the business, mostly technical people, but like I say, the web interface works. Um, and the way that we've done that is two really big things. So the first one is, Developers don't hate writing documentation. Developers hate being inefficient. And because they're not really great at writing documentation, and it can be a painful process, and we just talked about how we've made that process better, they're not really confident. They're not, they don't always feel like they can have the impact. And so they don't always see the value. 
We have made that easier by adopting a content framework called Diataxis. It has very clear types of content. And if you look at our doc site, we have separate reference, concept and how to sections. And this is to do with the developer journey. Are you coming here to learn about connection pools for Postgres? Or are you here to set one up? In which case, step one, go to your service overview page. Step two, follow this, you know. So those are two different things. You come to learn or you come to do, and there might be a reference. We have a list of the plugins that are available, lots of Postgres extensions, those types of things. So making sure that developers have like a clear framework. Here is how you write this type of content. You don't need to think. This is developer experience, but it's writer experience, right? This is, this is making the easy thing the right thing for people who know the things we need our customers to know. Lots of the work was done by um, developer relations. I wouldn't say any of us are really specialist writers either, but the guide, the guide guard rails, guidelines, guard rails, pick one, um, worked well for us as well. Um, so having the structure there was a really important thing. The second part, I would love to claim as a great triumph in my career, but actually I'm only seeing it now in hindsight. The second part is about building the community internally and helping people know that they can contribute and making sure that we have everyone available. We do regular office hours, we do onboarding, we're available to help with review. This project's got its own Slack channel that we use internally. And bringing those people in and giving them the support to succeed was a big part of it. So there's like the tooling and the structure, but then there's also this big enablement, which has needed a lot of people. But now we have a lot of enabled people. They need a lot less. They can enable each other. So it's interesting because you're saying that you know, it, it, your developer relations team are not necessarily like technical writing experts, but if you were to like draw a matrix of people who know how to code, people who know how to write or teach and, and like whatever all those Venn diagrams are of overlap, I imagine you would find that more developer relations people know how to both code and teach than engineers who know how to both code and teach. And so to me, it does kind of feel like a specialist skill set, even if other people have the ability to contribute, right? And, and like, the thing I'd be curious to hear about is like, uh, you know, we talked about tooling, but let's say that there's someone in the company who is contributing, who doesn't have a lot of experience, you know, teaching technical concepts. How do you make sure that the prose part of it or, or the more explanatory part of it are, you know, relatable and accessible? So we use the review process on GitHub to go through. Sometimes I'll just edit. You know, if this thing is otherwise great, I don't want to stand in anyone's way. I will, I mean, Ivan's a very international company. So hardly anyone is a native English speaker. I just go through and, you know, try and clear up the English. English the English, as I like to say, English is not a verb. Um, and make it to a point where it's clear, it's understandable, let's get it in front of the customer. We, we're not perfectionists, you definitely could find problems with our written English there, but trying to make sure that it's, a, it's good enough and it's factually correct, we test all the steps, we review all the language, and then off it goes. So just trying not to overstate that, but making sure that people know the support is there. You can send me a list of bullet points if you have to, and we can work on it. Right. Um, how do you deal with versioning? Like one of the things I noticed when I was looking through the Avon docs is there are so many different technologies that you all support, right? And I can only imagine the versioning complexity that comes along with that. Like how do you actually manage, you know, so many different projects all pulling up to this core, uh, you know, platform? It's actually less bad than it sounds. So Ivan, because we're a SaaS, we, there aren't different versions of Ivan. So the main product roles releases whenever, all the developer tools and CLI, the Terraform stuff, and the docs just kind of follow along as best we can. You know, if there's a bleeding edge feature that's shipped today, the docs might not go live till next week. That's okay, the feature's always gonna be there, the docs are always gonna be there. Um, 
Sometimes we'll end up removing things, you know, if we had a workaround for an old version of Postgres, when that goes end of life, the product owners will typically pop in and say, oh, you could take this out. Some of them make their own changes. Some of them just tell us they'll open the issue on GitHub describing what needs to change. Um, but we don't have that much documentation that duplicates our upstream projects. So the Ivan platform hosts open source projects. Postgres has documentation. Redis has documentation. Kafka has documentation. We don't need to write that. We need to show you how to use it in an Ivan context, how the connectors work. You know, we always use SSL, which isn't always the default. So then we've got some tutorials on connecting with different code bases. Those things usually don't change between versions. Um, and if they do, then we'll just add nodes. So it's quite low tech, but it's less of a problem. It is a lot of products. <laughs> it's less of a problem than it seems because the SAS is rolling release. So the docs are as well. Right. Probably more of a problem for the engineering team rolling out all the new versions. Yeah, definitely. And just making sure that we've got things when we're doing product launches. Yeah. Um, but again, we're working docs as code so we can prepare everything in a branch, mm -hmm. get it reviewed. We have previews on all our docs branches so we can put it in front of people and say, this is what we've got. And when the main product, if it is a big upgrade or something, does go live onto the main platform, we can have the docs ready to just follow. And that's a million miles from what we used to have in terms of having to go through and edit each file on the right day. Mm -hmm. so I haven't got time for that. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you're deploying to Cloudflare, right? Um, what does that pipeline actually look like? And I, and I, I believe, Diataxis somehow is used maybe by Cloudflare as well, right? And so they're, I don't know how tied together the project is with the organization, but I know that they, they use it for their docs as well, if that's correct. Yeah, let me try and put some of those building blocks into it. I feel like you need a picture, but I'm going to try and just mime. Uh, you can have a verbal picture. So we have Diataxis is a content framework. So that's a philosophy about how your content should look. The content itself uses a tool called Sphinx, which is a Python based static site generator with bells and whistles. Actually, I pick Sphinx because we're a Python shop, but then every new feature we've had requested already exists in Sphinx. It's hmm. incredible. Um, but if you're using Hugo or Gatsby or Jekyll or Eleventy, or you've basically seen Sphinx, right? This is the Python version. So when we merge to our main branch, that gets picked up by Cloudflare that then runs our build step. And it's just a make uh, mm. step to make the static HTML. That's it, the site's live. So every deployment is a complete fresh build. It's not just the diff, the site's getting bigger all the time, <laughs> but it still does it within a couple of minutes. Um, and it means that we also have isolated builds using the same process for every pull request, we get a preview build. So that's really cool as well. That's really interesting. I, you know, it's funny. I, I didn't even pick up when I was researching this that Diataxis was like less of a, a technical framework and more of a philosophical framework about writing this. That's that's really really interesting. So interesting. So you are doing your own implementation of this almost like pedagogical philosophy in Sphinx. But you're implementing it from scratch, right? Like it's not giving you the site framework to work from. No, and Sphinx gives you a lot of freedom there. It means we can break the rules if we want to. Um, I mean, they're literally, they're just text files with content in them. And the ones in the how-to folder are structures of the how-to. They clearly describe what you will achieve and the steps are numbered. There are no options, no extra explanations, no forks in the path. It's a task. You follow the steps, you achieve the task. Mm. The, uh, the, the concepts are more like explanation. So if it's something that you haven't worked with before, because some of our, some of our products on Ivan, you probably haven't heard of or used, you know, Apache Cassandra, um, Apache Flink, M3DB, like none of these are especially mainstream. Mm. MySQL, Redis, probably people might have seen them. Obviously, it's the first time for somebody, um, and I always try to remember that. But some of these things we know the majority of users might be new. And so we'll need to explain the concepts of the different 
uh, namespaces and what it means to have something that's unaggregated and what the retention periods do and the impact of changing that and changing it after you've created it. These might be new concepts. So that um, explainer content is intentionally a different structure to the mm. task content. And then we also have the reference content where you can just look up what configuration is available, you know, which Grafana um, plugin can I have? And they're all just there. How did you decide to use this particular educational like framework, right? Like, like you've been writing content, I would imagine for longer than, than someone had written up how diataxis works. I think my ideas in this space have kept on evolving, you know, over time, I think we've got better as an industry at this space. You know, if you read those early blog posts, I had no clue. Um, I spend a lot of time in the write the docs community. Mm -hmm. They're pretty serious about documentation and about really being so user centered and so developer experience oriented. And that's where I came across both the people and the concept um, behind Diataxis. Um, and it's something that you see talked about a lot in that space. And I just felt it was a really good fit for the type of content we wanted to produce, but mm -hmm. also because it's so prescriptive, it makes it a really good fit for something that has a lot of contributors, lots mm -hmm. of documentation. You know, there's like five tech writers in a room and they do one product each. You then they can do whatever they like because they are the only people who need to understand it. You only got specialists doing things. Yeah. In this case, it's more like crowdsourced. <laughs> um, and they're all professionals in their own right, but they're not necessarily documentation specialist. So mm -hmm. having that extra structure worked really well. I had seen that Diataxis was used for the Django documentation, which is another Python framework. And that is also open source, lots of contributors, lots of different things. And it had worked well for them. I knew that we would follow, because we didn't have a, a dedicated docs team, knew that we would follow a similar model. Um, and so we gave it a try. I am about 18 months in on this project now, and I have no regrets. Great. Um, are there any organizations that you see out there creating docs that you really are, are impressed by and sort of look up to? There are a bunch, and I was at the Dev Portal Awards last night. Perhaps we can drop this link in the show notes. There are some some seriously good ones. I'm I previously worked at Vonage, who have quite a good dev platform. Um, Stripe are always mentioned. I've been very impressed with both Cloudflare and Netlify Docs mm -hmm. recently. You know, they are platforms that started simple and then started adding functionality that they needed. It's not so simple now, but they still managed to find their way. Um, and I got to mention GitHub. I'm not sure what to do. Just go and look how GitHub did it. And, you know, I might not do it that way, but it lets me think about how should this be? Who's really fanatical about developer experience? This is a place that will help me to think about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, it's kind of cool how much of a discipline it has become within these companies. Like, you know, thinking back to a lot of early developer docs, like I used to spend a lot of time on php.net, right? And I'm sure you did too. Those docs I actually thought were really well written, but it now feels so archaic when you compare it to something like Stripe's docs, for example, where you can run code in the docs and get this like real time feedback and very like iterative experience. And um, it's cool to see the whole like field moving in, I don't know, like a more, I think intentional direction uh, with, with that stuff in mind. Yeah, I think seeing it as its own discipline is really great. And the thing that I'm also seeing is more developers, especially I'm going to be controversial and say the successful ones, really taking care to write and to work on that skill. Because when you're a very senior developer, you need to communicate well. And so writing docs all the way through or writing blog posts or, you know, being the person that sends out the comms for your team, those skills stay with you and it's a skill that you develop. And if you doubt that, go and read my earliest blog posts and then my latest ones. I hope you'll agree that I've improved. I'm sure you have. Um, I what advice would you give for 
engineers who want to learn how to communicate better because I, I do think that at least in like a traditional curriculum they're they're seen as fairly isolated disciplines and a lot of computer science departments don't optimize for technical communication or really any kind of communication i think looking for reasons to write is is really um is really important and to reflect on what you've written as well so i worked as a support engineer pretty early in my career and then i had to learn to communicate well um you can fake that by writing answers on Stack Overflow or keeping your own blog um, and seeing what comments you get back, what people get stuck on um, and things like that. So it's it's looking for reasons to write and mm -hmm. trying to do it well. Um, the tips that I always give for writing well is know who your audience is and know what your goal is, right? Because it's you have to see it from their point of view. Um, first of all, we're all busy, so less is always more. Um, write the outline and try and take things out and then write in a really direct way. Because if you know who it's for, mm -hmm. that will help you understand what you need to include. Yeah. I, I particularly love the idea of support as a vehicle for teaching communication. Um, it, when I was at Twilio, and I don't think they do this anymore, but I could be wrong everyone had to do a support shift, like engineers, DevRel, marketing people, recruiters, like we all had to do some kind of support shift. And I learned so many things that were like missing or incorrect in our docs by doing that. Um, yep. it, it was like, there was no substitute for it at all. Like that, that was the best QA you can help for and the best way to learn how to communicate. Yeah, and the best way to, you know, we're in DevRel, we meet people at events or they open issues on our demo projects or whatever, but support shows you really where your product is hitting your audience and what's happening. If you ever get the opportunity to pick up a support shift, fill in over the festive break or whatever, always do it because you will learn so much. People, a bit like complaining about documentation, people complain about support. Mm -hmm. This is a discipline in its own right and it will help you as either an engineer or an advocate in your career if you have those skills. Yeah, but probably uh, as a manager too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much. I know we're coming up on time here. Um, I, I always like to end with kind of like a, a fun question that's a little bit of a, a thought experiment for people I'm talking to. Um, if there was someone in the world who you've never met uh, that you could take to lunch and just pick their brain for a couple of hours, like, who would you want to get that time with? And they could be in the tech world, could be in the wider world, but is there someone that you really love to learn from? This is a really great question. And I think I might have needed some warning um, to think about it because I feel I'm interested in so many things. It's technology, yes, um, but also like the social side of things. Um, and the way that we operate as a species, if that's not a weird way to talk about as, as an industry. Um, I think I'm going to choose Kathy Sierra. Mm. Um, she's one of the headfirst authors. She's an incredible and inspirational teacher and speaker. I've never even seen her speak, um, never mind being to lunch with her. But I enjoyed her writings so much when she had a blog, and I think we'd have a really insightful conversation about how we can best serve users with technology. I love that. Um, well, thank you so much, Lorna. I really enjoyed hearing everything you, you had to share, and um, I really appreciate your time. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, definitely you know, subscribe and follow if you uh, want to hear more. Um, and uh, happy hacking, everyone. The State of Developer Education is brought to you by Major League Hacking or MLH. To find out more about MLH and how we power innovation, cultivate developer communities, and teach technical skills to students around the world, visit mlh.io. And then make sure to search for Developer Education in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at MLH, thanks for listening and helping us empower the next generation of technologists. Happy hacking.